Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite theorems, as usually just my bias perspective and things I like. Um, today I want to talk about Pascal's triangle, or let's say a fractal structure in Pascal's triangle, um, in a different incarnation in the form of the so-called Lucas theorem, which is a really beautiful theorem about binomial coefficients. Um, and it's related to fractals, and it's related to a lot of stuff, representation theory of SL2 or whatever. Um, so let's just jump right into it. So um, the first thing I would like to say is, well, here's Pascal's triangle. You all know how this works. It is once going along the two boundaries. So you start off with a one and you have this pattern that, well, let's see in green, so that you can see here. So whenever you are somewhere, well, let's say here, what, what, what would like to know what this number is, then it's just a sum of, it, of its two upper neighbors. Okay. Um, Pascal's triangle has been discovered by many different cultures in many different contexts. It's one of the universal kind of thing-ish, whatever you, you see in mathematics and um, Really, it has been discovered by so many people, um, not just by Pascal. It's, it's very old, Chinese knew it, uh, Babylonians knew it, and uh, whatever, you know. It's one of the things that if you find an alien civilization, they probably have discovered their own version of Pascal's triangle. It's not 100% sure, we, we don't know, right? But um, it, it's one of the things that is just beyond the human, the, the human existence. It's just, it's just what it is, it's really beautiful. Very easy pattern. So just let's do it again. So if I would like to compute this 10 here, I would just take six plus four. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about Pascal's triangle itself, but I'm doing a funny trick, which you, I hope you haven't seen before because it's really beautiful and very surprising if you see it for the first time. So you just take the numbers in Pascal's triangle and you take the modulo sum prime. So you look at remainders modulo division by a prime um, in my example here, I take the easiest prime I can imagine. Well, uh, the only odd prime, the only weird prime too, the smallest prime, um, not the easiest, but certainly the smallest. And division by two means you have two possible remainders, the black one, the odd numbers, and uh, uh, the white boxes, the even numbers. And if you do this whole pattern and you just, just look at the numbers in Pascal's triangle and you need to decide whether they are even or odd. Then you get this, this uh, pattern here with those black and white regions. And this is actually a fractal. And in order to see this, we look at uh, a video. So what you can see now is, well, a really big black square. <laughs> and that's kind of the first, the first number. It's, I, I omit the numbers because they won't be visible anymore if I zoom out anyway. So this is the first starting square of Pascal's triangle, which we'll see in a second as soon as I click on uh, on the video. Um, and it, doing it mod two, after mod two run through, I do it mod three. After run three, uh, mod three run through, I do it mod five. And you will see it doesn't depend on the prime; it just gives you a very nice fractal structure. Let's let's go. Okay, here you go, modulo two. Can you see the pattern? So the fractal pattern you should see here, I, I let it run, is modulo three. So um, again, white regions is uh, is where everything is zero. That's that's the mo most important part. Part everything else. So the colors indicate different remainders by division by uh, by five in this case. But you basically can ignore it for now. Just the important part is the white versus the not white part, and you can see this fractal pattern. And what I mean by that is um, I zoom out, and that's exactly what the video does, and you see the same pattern repeating on a, on a larger scale with the small pattern inside. And that's, that's a fractal. Um, for the experts, strictly speaking, that's what is called an inverse fractal, because for other fractals that you might have seen, like, like a Mandelbrot or a Julia set, um, it's more like you zoom in and you see patterns repeating on a smaller scale. Whatever you want to call it, inverse fractal or fractal, the point is you zoom out and see patterns repeating on a, on a larger scale. 
So the question would be, can we understand those? So can we understand these fractal patterns in Pascal's triangle? It's just really just Pascal's triangle, what you would be. Pretty beautiful, still pretty beautiful. It's still one of the things an alien civilization might have discovered. We don't know. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just too beautiful. It's beyond humans. Um, in particular, it's beyond me, right? It's, it's just far away. Um, and the only thing we actually need to understand is, uh, in order to do this, it's, it's, it's a little bit easier to work with Pascal's triangle by, by, by knowing that the numbers are binomial coefficients. Let me recall or explain whatever we want, how this works. So first of all, we need to decide what columns and rows are in Pascal's triangle. Um, and that's a bit tricky because of the way we like to draw it. We like to draw it like this. You actually should draw it like this and it would become much easier to see what the columns are and what the rows are. But anyway, the standard convention is said like that, or I don't know whether, whether it's said or not, but that's just a standard convention. Probably the one you're used to that you're drawing a triangle like, like it's, um, like we have a little nail here and it's, it's like hanging down like whatever picture hanging on a nail like a picture. Um, but it's still, it's not too bad. It's really like, you should think of this being the, the boundary of a, of a more matrix-like shape. And then those things are the other rows, which you start counting at zero. Might be a bit confusing. So zero, one, two, uh, this is the third, of course, four, five, six, something like that, right? And the columns are a bit trickier because they're a little bit, they go along this way, like the fifth column here. And then if you, let's say, would like to compute this number here, what this number is, then it would be something over five because I already told you that this is the fifth column. Um, and now I just need to count rows. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So this is 12 over five. And the way why this works, uh, some nice exercise if you want to do it for yourself, is this recursion in the um, binomial coefficient, which is exactly the way how Pascal's triangle is built. Okay, so the only thing I said on this slide is, in order to understand this nice pattern, we should understand binomials and what they do modulo p. And this is exactly where Lucas' theorem um, kicks in. And, it was, it was, Lucas was a French mathematician in the 19th century, I think. <laughs> um, he's famous for many other things, but I think his most famous theorem is what I'm going to show you. Anyway, try to understand binomials model B. In order to do so, I need to tell you a little bit about periodic numbers or periodic no, no, certainly not about periodic numbers. That's something for a different video, probably, about periodic expansions. And this is a very easy idea. So if you have a number like 1,038, um, then in, what does this actually mean? Right? Think about it. What does 1,038 mean? Um, OK, there could be 1,038 apples, but that's not what I'm, what I'm trying to say here. It basically means the following. You pick out the digits, and they are called the 10 adic digits in this case. So just the digits. And the position tells you what kind of power of, of, of 10 you have. So secretly, or not secretly, actually, uh, 10 38 is 1 times 10 cubed plus 0 times 10 squared plus 3 times 10 plus 8. And we write it like this. So square brackets, the digits, whatever, AK, blah, blah, blah. And the base down here, P, base is 10. Um, and you can do this, and this is really exciting, actually. You can do this with any base. And um, there have been different, um, so this is our system, what we're used to. And there have been different number systems throughout the world. Babylonians like to use something like base 60. You might have heard about base two, which is binary, the what, computer language. Or sometimes people like to use hexadecimal, which is base 60. But anyway, let me explain base 5, because that's the example I have here. So in base 5, you take the same number, you play the same game. But now the only things you're allowed to put here are powers of 5. Okay. 
uh, so five, five, so this five to the zero is one, five, five squared, 25, five cubed, 125, five to the four is 625. And you just, just, there will be unique integers to make this, this summation work. And these are the five Arctic digits in this case. And you will write it in exactly the same expression, right? It, it's, it's really like just writing the number and put in uh, some commas in between and remember the base, that's it. And the point is that you can already see it here. So here you have an H turning up. This can't happen here because by construction or by, by convention, uh, the, the digits that you see that are called periodic digits, the biggest one to, to zero, go from zero to the biggest one would be uh, B minus five. So in this case, the biggest number you could see is four. Here, you all know that in uh, base 10, our, our standard system, the biggest number you could see is nine, of course. The biggest digit you could see is nine. And that's an instance of base 10. In, say it again, in base five, the biggest digit you would see is four. In hexadecimal, the biggest digit you would see would be 15. And if you know computer language, then 15 in this case is something like an F because people just don't write, like, like to write 15. Um, 10 is A, 11 is B, 12 is C, 13 is D, 14 is uh, E, and 15 is then F. But basically they're just symbols anyway. So you're allowed to have uh, B symbols ranging from zero to B minus. Okay, now enter the theorem. So the Lucca theorem. Um, so you want to compute this binomial and there might, there might be n, 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 k might be huge. They might be way down in Pascal's triangle, way down here, okay? And this is how it works. It's a beautiful theorem uh, in order to compute binomials modulo P because you don't need to compute huge numbers. It works as follows. So take your two numbers, here's my n and here's my k. Right, I want to compute n over k. And I, I don't need to compute 1038 over 696. I have no idea what that is. Um, it works like this. So fix your prime, p, so my base, and express it periodically. This is just what you get, okay? This is just what you get, whatever. 6111 or 417. And then the theorem says that you do the following. You, you look at the digits, six, 111, 611, 417, 417. And this huge binomial is a product of the small binomials, which are now much smaller, right? The, the worst thing you see is something like a, 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 an 11 over 7 here, instead of a, a thousand something over 700, basically. And you only need to compute that, and you see, well, okay, that's not too bad, and you see it's 10 modules. Good. And that's exactly what this theorem says. So in general, um, N over K modulo P is a product of the digits of the periodic, of the periodic digits. So N over N R over K R times blah, 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 times N zero over K zero. Binomials modulo P are products of the binomials along the periodic digits. Extremely powerful theorem to compute binomials. Really beautiful. Uh, Lucas theorem. And how does it help to understand Pascal's triangle modulo P? Well, back to Pascal. So let's have a look. So in the third row, what you would do is, so this is here, um, three modulo two, this is modulo two. So three modulo two is certainly one comma one. Why? Because this is just one plus two is three, of course. Okay. So whatever three over K is, it's one over K one and it's one over K zero. But K1 and K0, so Ki, are either one, 0 or 1. Whatever they are, this guy will be 1, and so will be this guy. And you will see that 3 over K modulo 2 is always 1. And this is exactly this black row here. Because it ends in 1, 1, 1. It has a lot of 1s. And the same for the next one here. This periodically is the 1, 1, 1 case. And same pattern. And there will be one down here, the next one, the one, 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 one case, which is scaled. You scale everything because jumping in a digit is times two in this case. 
So you scale everything by a factor of two, but the same pattern repeats. Similarly, for the next row, for the fourth row, the fourth row is down here. In this case, uh, four has a, starts with one and has then a lot of zeros, okay? Of course, because it's just two squared, it's four, right? And the only way such a product can be non-zero is if, if all the appearing digits are non-zero, uh, are zero. So that's exactly the case where you get those two appearing and everything else dies. Because otherwise, for example, um, if you have zero over one, like, like, like this could be zero over one, then by convention, those binomial could be. And the same thing repeats for the next one, which is one, zero, 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 which is down here, right? Just scaled by a factor of two. And that's why you get this nice fractal pattern. Like I said again, zooming out, you see a factor of two in this case, or a factor of P in general, and you can read it off from the binomial, uh, from the biotic extension by using um, Lucas theorem. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Uh, hope to see you next time.